This episode of the Western Outdoor News Podcast is brought to you by Penn. Every bite on the water is just the beginning of a gear-testing battle of man versus fish. In this game, there are no ties. Since 1932, Penn has equipped saltwater anglers worldwide with gear built specifically to deliver an advantage over angry fish that's as reliable as the tide tables. Penn's new Workhorse Battle 3 spinning reel with proprietary CNC gear technology and the proven durability of an HT100 carbon fiber drag system comes in nine sizes to allow anglers to take the battle to the fish wherever they swim. Go to PennFishing.com and let the battle begin. Hey folks, and welcome back. This is episode 36 of the Western Outdoor News Podcast. This week we talk with Promar Pro Staff, Gil Hernandez. Gil and the guys over at Promar have been working on putting together Lobster Hooping 101, an instructional video to get you started lobster hoop netting. This video goes over the basics, organization, and some key pieces of information to help you be successful on the water. If those eyes come in, if you slide that gauge over the horn of the carapace, and that, those eyes on that lobster move just a hair, that lobster is short. This video is geared towards beginners being a general overview of all things lobster hoop netting, but many seasoned anglers will benefit as well. Well, before we jump into it with Gil, folks, I'd like to try to just go through the paper with you this week. On page one, we have Pyramid Lake looking to be in prime shape for the opener October 1st. Looks like the yellowfin are beginning to fill in the counts and more and more are moving in every day. For the SoCal freshwater scene, fall is really getting, getting into full effect here. We have the largemouth bass starting to bite again. It looks like uh, a couple nice ones at DVL this past week as well. Some striper action at Paris and DVL as well. Santee Lakes is prepping for their Stockzilla event in the beginning of October. And as we move into the eastern Sierra, we see that the forest closures are now back open and good counts coming from a lot of the lakes such as Crowley. Don't forget folks we got Big Bear Lake Trout Fest just around the corner that's October 2nd through 3rd. Conditions are shaping up nicely and hefty stockings are setting the stage for a solid derby. As we get further north the Sacramento River salmon fishing looks to be holding pretty strong in the upper river from Woodson Bridge all the way above Barge Hole. <clears throat> plenty, plenty of kings in Klamath and trout fishing is just about as good as it gets at Don Pedro Reservoir. For the Delta it looks like fall fishing's in full effect. We have some stripers in the mix as well as some large mouth bass and as we move into some hunting stuff we have a, a piece by tim hovey obsessed with waterfowl it looks like this lack of water may have pretty adverse effects on the waterfowl hunting this year and as we move back into the saltwater scene down here in southern california good yellowtail action at the islands been kind of hit or miss but it seems to be getting more and more consistent as the fall goes on bigger fish 15 to 30 pounders it looks like that big bluefin is still out at the tanner bank and cortez as well for the northern saltwater section, it looks like we got some, some good sheephead and cod counts coming in right now. That's the central coast, solid on the reds. Still a little blue, bit of bluefin fever up there in Monterey Bay, and some big sea bass being caught as well. Of course, the rockfish fishing remains consistent up there with the big lingcod starting to come over the rail too. Not hearing too, too much about the albacore bite up there. From what I've heard, it's been pretty slow for the, for the most part. This whole issue is available online at wonews.com. Check it out and subscribe. We have a summer special still going on right now. Let's just roll right into it here with Gil on Lobster Hooping 101 two weeks prior to lobster season it just gets out of control in a good way where I get to actually speak about the things that I love and um, get ready for the season I know that a lot of people they start to get the actual bug the hooping bug a couple months before the season and it gets me excited so uh, yeah us at Promar we we kind of put our heads together and it, it's kind of funny that we tried doing this um, a year prior uh, doing a video and we actually went out and filmed and we did all this stuff and then we realized that some of the lighting wasn't right and some of the equipment that we had wasn't right so we we didn't actually um, publish it then and we decided hey we're going to just go back out and we're going to we're just going to get back at it and and I think too when we made this hooping video um, we kind of collaborated with all the seminars that we've done in the past and, and even, even pro staffers and things that we've done in the past. And, and we don't want to make it so complicated to where we're actually getting people afraid to come out lobster hooping. So that's kind of what this video was all about. And um, hopefully a lot of people have seen it. Um, if not, hopefully you come and visit our page at uh, promarnets.com and, and check it out. But it's, it's kind of flying through social media now. So I'm pretty sure people will, will get a peek at it. Yeah, it seems to be doing really well. It's, 
what's what I liked about it was, you know, you go through every step and you talk about a lot of the things you talk about are just keeping it simple and keeping it organized. And when you're organized, it is more simple because you got everything right there. Yes. Yes. And, and I, and I feel, yeah, you know, it's, and it's over the years of lobster hooping and, you know, Jim Salazar, he's been like the godfather to me and he's on my, he's on the Hobie pro team with me as well. And we spent a lot of time together at, at, at shows and stuff and just talking, talking about the good and the bad and, and the things that people do and the p- things that people don't do. And I think that the most important thing is talking to these wardens, you know, and making sure that you spend time with the wardens, um, whether you're at a show um, or whether you're on the dock. Um, and, in, you know, in the, in the opening night, going to Dana or Long Beach, you're going to see them. You know, I mean, I went a couple years ago, I was at Dana, and there was at least seven game wardens on the dock. And every person, you know, that was on the dock was getting talked to and not in a good way. Um, I show up with my boat and game warden boards my boat and he was kind of shocked. He says, man, I'm, I'm a little shocked. And I said, why is that? Well, you're super organized. He's like, you have all your nets stacked. You have your, you have your hoop net in the front, one hoop net in the front with all your bugs in it. And you actually have a place for me to sit, make my job a little easier. He's like, I walk on your boat. All you guys have gauges around your neck, lobster gauges around your neck. And you guys have all your cards out and they're all filled out. He's like, it makes my job so easier. He's like, I almost don't even want to board your boat because I know you're you're pretty legit. And so that's what we're going for. And when it comes to lobster hooping, I was talking to a gentleman yesterday, another editor yesterday, and I was saying, you know, the actual thing of hop lobster hooping is not very complicated. It's, you know, depths, rope, hoop net, and bait. Other than that, it's pretty much like the luck of the draw. It's like pulling a slot machine. Are you going to get the lobster? Maybe. You may be at the best casino where someone just won, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, You can go to the same casino and you can come back broke, you know. Um, But what you can't get away from is the regulations. And the regulations is something that we really want to enforce on the angler. And we don't want to take responsibility for those regulations on our Promar, right? We want people to, in the video you'll see, we want people to take responsibility for themselves to know these regulations because there's a lot of them. And that's by them doing their homework, talking to game wardens, visiting a Bass Pro Shop or a Turner's and picking up a game a game warden book and researching the book and researching what the regulations for these spinal lobster are. Yeah, and understanding that they're, these regulations are there for a reason because, you know, even down to measuring the lobster and how you do it, a lot of people get stopped on technicalities like that small. They thought they were measuring their lobster the right way the whole time. And yes. they weren't, you know, they were clickers or they were, they were not quite right. Um, yes. So you need to know, and that's one thing to really ask. And, and they're, they're willing to show you is, Hey, I've been measuring my lobster like this. How do you measure your lobster? Ask the warden how, you know, the proper way to do exactly. it is. So that's a huge, uh, huge part of it. And you bring up, you bring up a solid point because in that measuring a lobster. So that's one of the one things I've actually talked to a game warden because people would say, well, the game wardens have different gauges than we have. And that is a true question. Like you're not going to see a game warden with the Promar gauge in his hand. Their gauges are more of a solid projectile. It's, it's a piece of solid metal. Um, it's a little heavier and the way the game wardens have told me to measure lobster, I can kind of probably sense people turning up their computer or their, their tablets and stuff for now is they measure the lobster from the back to the front of the carapace. Now the measurement has to be three and a quarter. Now what the game warden has told me is that when you measure from the back to the front, now if it's a ginormous bug, they're going to measure from the front to the back. But if it's a close bug, close lobster, they will measure from the back to the front. And what they're looking for is any eye movement in the bug. So if that bug if those eyes come in, if you slide that gauge over the horn of the carapace and that uh, those eyes on that lobster move just a hair, that lobster is short. And so that's where I go from. And so that's where we kind of encourage people to even maybe even file their gauge down just a tad bit just to play, play it on the safe side. Because the majority of tickets that I see getting written uh, throughout the year are going to be one, of course, from short lobster. And I seen the argument. I was on the dock last year and 
they were arguing with the game warden that the hair, the hair on the lobster was attached to the carapace. So that was part of the carapace. And that is not true. Um, the hard body, the hard structure of the carapace is where you're measuring from. Um, so the, the short lobsters, of course, are going to be the, the go-getters uh, a lot of times for tickets. I always tell people that the minute they have a lobster in a hand that's short, you have to get rid of it as quick as you can. And people are like ask me, well, why? Why, why do you? Well, because first of all, it's legal. But the, the second reason is, is the minute you have a short lobster that may be a hair short and it's sitting in your hand, as the seconds go by in your mind, that lobster is getting more legal and legal <laughs> as the time goes on. A hundred percent. So get rid of that lobster as quick as you can, because the longer you hold it in your hand, the longer you're going to, con- you're going to convince yourself that that lobster is legal and it's not. So just get rid of it. Yep. All clickers go overboard on my boat. And the second one too, is that it's very, the, 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 the game warnings tell me that majority of the tickets other than short lobsters, um, probably the more majority are not filling out the lobster cards correctly. And that's the number one thing. And, You'll get the guy, he says, I always get the guy that comes in. He had a really hard day, lobster hooping. He didn't catch any lobsters. He comes in. I ask for his lobster card. He gives me his lobster card. He's all bummed out. Yep, no lobster. I uh, spent, you know, six hours on the water. You know, it's three in the morning or whatever. And he looks at the lobster card, and there's not a number zero where lobster detained. Ticket. The minute you do not put a number on and you hit the dock and you don't have a number in a lobster tame, you're going to get a ticket. So it's very important to document that. Yeah. One of the questions I kind of have, and it's, it's something you were, you were kind of touching on, because you said every time you catch a legal lobster market, so you're doing a tally, correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you do a tally, and if you have nothing, just a zero. You can't leave it blank. You have to at least have can't a zero. Mm-hmm. That's the way to do it. So, um, and then obviously the gear code is very important. Make sure you have the right gear code and then your location code. And, um, yes. that's, that's stuff that's all provided on the lobster report card. Don't go cutting off that bottom half thinking, <laughs> you know, what the codes are. Exactly. Um, keep Don't that thing on that. there. I know they're huge and they're long and they're kind of a pain in the butt, but if you have a good place to store it on your boat, do it. Isn't that crazy how long those lobsters, I mean, it just blows my mind. Every year, this lobster, this lobster card, whenever I do seminars, I pull this thing out, man. It's like, I feel like I need to put a flag on it. or It's like a flagpole on this thing. It's <laughs> super long. Um, but yeah, it's, but you know, another thing too is, is, you know, keeping a tally. And usually if I'm, a lot of times I hoop, depending if I'm in an area like a Dana or a, lot, a harbor area, I usually stay in the same place. But if I'm like in a, a, a Redondo or even like a San Diego Um, you know, going from Mission Bay to San Diego Bay or pushing one brick wall to another, you have to remember too that if I'm in that area, I will just fish that area and then document my lobsters at the end of the trip. Well, I will not put my boat into gear if I'm traveling without documenting my lobsters. So give you an example is that if I'm fishing Dana Point and I decide to go down fish San Clemente somewhere, um, I have to document my lobsters in Dana Point before I even put my boat into gear. Okay? Yes. Mm-hmm. You have to understand that game wardens are always glassing you. Okay. When I mean glassing you is they're always watching you and they are watching you at night and they have special binoculars and they have special thing. I mean, I was pulled up on a game warden one time and you would have thought he was a Navy SEAL. I mean, black boat, blacked out, you know, comes on the boat like, dude, where were you? Like, I had no idea you were, I mean, they know where you are at all times. So the minute you're in transaction, you you, you move your boat, um, they're following you, you know? And if they follow you to your next spot and then they board you and you don't have a number of lobster detained for that movement, you're going to get a ticket. So if you're going to fish one area and you know, as a group of people, you're going to fish a different area. You need to document your lobsters detained before you even put your boat in the gear. Um, that's why it's important before you even before you even step in your boat from your car that your lobster card is filled out. Because if you are in trans- transaction to your lobster spot and you get stopped prior to dropping your nets um, and you're getting ready, even if you drop one net, you, you look at you're going to get questioned. You know, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, why is your lobster card filled out? So. 
the documentation of the lobster cards are huge, huge. Know how to fill out your lobster cards. I cannot beat that in people's heads. I spend so much time in my seminars talking about more regulations um, than the actual uh, hooping itself. Um, and I tell people all the time in my seminars, what is the most important tool in lobster hooping? And everyone, I get every answer. I get, I get the hoop net. I get the bait. I get this <laughs> and that. I even get the lobster card. But actually, the most important thing is a pen. Because without a pen, you can do nothing. Okay. Without a pen, say you you say you have a pen in your car and you fill your your lobster card on the dock, and then you go out lobster hooping, right? And now you catch lobster, and now you have no pen. What do you do? You got to go in. Right. We got to let all your lobster go and go in. Exactly, and that's <laughs> and that's the thing. I tell people put a box of pens in your boat. I have for me in my kayak and my boat, I, I have a, I have a dry a Plano containers that are sealed up and they're stacked with pens because weather is going to get those pens. Um, I've been on, um, when I first started hooping, you know, you know, one out of 20 pens works, right? Yeah. You know, it's like, are you checking your pens at like your regular gear before you go out? Because it's one of the most important tools in your, in your lobster bag. And so, Making sure that your your card is is uh, not wet and all these things, you know, these are the things we have to consider when we when we first started this podcast. Is what you know, organization, right? Getting yeah. yourself organized. You know, these are the things the game wardens are looking for. Um, a lot of it, it's it's like you know, it's like painting a house. Ninety percent of the work's prep. <laughs> really, yeah. you got to be prepared to have everything ready, and you know, everything in order to make sure that you're not going to get in trouble when you're out there because let's face it, getting in trouble while you're out on the water is just about the worst thing any waterman could have happen to oh, yeah. him, you know? Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, and the thing is, it's like, it's not worth it, you know? And this is what I tell, um, <clears throat> I see poachers, you know, in the water. Um, I threaten their lives, you know, I'm like, dude, what are you doing, man? Like, keep, you know, cause I, I, and when I'm on a kayak, especially I can actually pull up along people and most of the time, I just want to make friends and see if they need anything and see if they need advice. You know, you get these guys that are, yeah, I caught, caught a few. And I'm like, hey, let me see, you know, and it's a short lobster. I'm like, hey, dude, first of all, I'm going to give you like two seconds to put that back. And then like you're going to get a phone call because we don't spend our hard earned money, you know, and we don't we don't spend our hard earned time doing regulations for you to catch short lobsters, you know, Um and it doesn't make it fun, you know, and, and that's the thing. It's like you do every once in a while, you get that family that goes out there that just doesn't know, you know, and you feel bad and, you, you know, but the, the game wardens aren't going to take a break on you, you know, and, and I get the I get the question all the time. Well, what's the ticket like? Right. Well, the ticket, it all depends on the judge, you know. Yeah. It, there's no set price for a short lobster. There's no set price for an unfilled lobster card. Right. There's no set price. You go to court, you talk to the judge, and he he's going to decide what he does for you. And I, and I, I talked to a game warden about this last year. He was on my boat for quite some time at the dock. And he was telling me all these crazy stories. He's like, man, we just got done pulching a guy for like 40 lobster or something. He's like, the guy that had one short lobster had the same fee as him. That's it's crazy. all depends on the judge. He's like, we get to, everybody says, well, what, what is that ticket like? And he goes, I, don't, I can't tell you what the ticket's like. Go to court and figure it out, you know? So if you have a judge that just loves lobster, that you know, I mean, lobster, he hate he, he just loves them to the point where he doesn't even want to eat it. You know, they're like his favorite friend. You know, and you see that judge, and you got caught for poaching lobster, he's probably going to throw the book at you. You know, so it all depends. You know, and that's 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 the game of of chance, right? And why I play the game of chance when you're supposed to go out and have fun. Um, and have a good time with your family and bring some, you know, harvested lobsters home. Like why, why play the game of like keeping a short lobster or not filling out the card or not doing your homework to where you can enjoy yourself on the water. You know, it even comes to the point where people say, you know, I'm going to bring uncle Billy on the boat, um, but he's not hoop netting. Can I just bring him for fun? And that's always like an underlying statement. Like what can I get away with? You know? And it's like, listen, man, the minute uncle Billy touches the steering wheel on your boat, the minute Uncle Billy picks up a lobster gauge, the minute Uncle Billy touches anything on the boat that has to do with any recreational lobster fishing, he's in violation. Yeah, he's now part of lobster hooping. Exactly. He's now yeah. part of lobster hooping, and you can't justify it any other way. So just do yourself a favor. Like, just get a lobster card. 
you know, buy, buy a fishing license, use it the whole year. Um, it's, it's not, you know, I mean the prices, you know, they go up, but you know, for, for 52, 66, you get a fishing license, you know, a lobster card is 10 54. Um, make sure you send them in on time. If not, you're going to get charged at 21 60 fee. Um, but it's not that much. It's not worth it to go out there and, and stress, you know, like stress out, like looking around if there's a game warden, worrying about coming in. Um, and I talk to a lot of these guys at seminars and you could tell like they just don't want to fork over the money to do it. And it's like, listen, man, you're already invested, like invest the rest of the, the money and the time to doing this because it's going to make you have much of a better time on the water. Yeah, you're I mean, we have the opportunity to go do this recreationally, whereas they could shut it down really at their discretion, especially if people are making poor decisions like that. It's like lobster's 40 bucks a pound last year. You know, it's like Exactly. You know, you get 7 bucks per person, you you're actually doing pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, you know, in the first couple of weeks, you know, and, and when we just talk about the 101s of lobster hooping, um, you know, everybody's out there the first couple of weeks and, and everyone does fairly well. But, you know, later in the season, it's just as good. I mean, I'm, I'm hooping right before the closer in, in March and I'm still catching lobsters, you know, and but I'm out there all by myself, you know. Um, there's no one out there. I mean, opening night, everyone kind of, everybody gets the bug, right? They get the bug, they go the first, maybe the first night. Um, and that's kind of, it. you know, it's kind of like the dove opener, right? People like shoot doves on the dove opener and they don't ever try to go back to the second dove opener. They don't shoot, you know, three days later, they just kind of go for the opener and then the hype's over it and they kind of sell their stuff on offer up or something. Um, and it's just kind of like the, kind of like the name of the game, but, uh, we at Promar, man, we, we want to encourage people that, that there's more to it. You know, there's not just this lobsters or there's crab as well there's there's a lot of things you can do throughout the season but the season gets better i remember talking with jim um salazar and he's like man gil like the best lobstering i've done is like mid-season and when we start to like put our hoops a little deeper and it's true you know and that's where you start to get these better ideas of like the structure of the land of where these lobsters are kind of crawling in, in the in the later winter months and yeah. And after those that, big storms move things around. And oh just, yeah. When that storm changes, comes, moves around and you know, they're, they're, it, they're crawling deeper. Yeah. And, and you look at the commercial guys, you know, the commercial guys, you know, they have their stuff out there in some crazy parts of water, you know, like, what is this lobster in here? And then you start to do some homework on it. And you realize, oh man, that's actually a killer calico spot. And I, and I tell people in my seminars, calicos and, and lobsters are like the same. They need food structure and current, you know, and that's why I always encourage all the kayakers and boaters. I'm like, man, during that commercial season of, of lobster season, you better go out your GPS, man, and mark every spot you possibly can because the minute those commercial guys are done a couple weeks after the season, that's like a prime time sand, ba- sand bass calico spot. Oh, yeah. You know? And so, but knowing the waters, you know, everybody's going to go near the break wall, right? And wow, well, it's easy, a break wall, a break wall. Um, but, you know, putting out towards more reef areas, putting out to more hard bottoms or drop offs, you know, and really putting the time in um, some of these guys do really, really well, you know, um, just doing their homework. So, um, you know, and that's what I find a lot of the people I take out on my kayak or my boat. They just want to know the basics. And so back to the video, um, we're giving people the basics and you're always going to get criticism for every, everything we do. You know, any, anything that I do, I've known this. Um, you can never be enough, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> some people are going to love it. Some people are going to hate it. But our 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 point in making this video wasn't to um, target the guy who's going to Catalina fishing the our XL heavy on a chain with you know two hundred feet of rope um, with a five man crew. You know that that's not what we're we're aiming towards. That's not our goal. Our, our goal for the one hundred and one video was. The new family or the new guy that says, hey, man, I got a kayak or, hey, I got a small skiff. Like, I've never done this before. Um, I want to go locally. Um, I want to fish between, you know, 40 and 60 feet of water. I don't want to do anything crazy. Uh, And in the video, you'll see me. I'm fishing a a certain setup that I like to fish or like to hoop is uh, the extension cord winder setup. And and that setup is typically for about 35 to 50 feet of water. Um, And it's supposed to make um the job easier as far as containing rope 
Um, we had guys uh, comment even like, oh, you guys have your, we have a, a, a promo, we have a weighted clip that we can actually slip to the buoy that adjusts the buoy. Um, and we like that setup. We like it for a lot of deeper water. Uh, for me personally, um, being in a kayak or being in a small skiff, um, I would rather adjust my ropes to the tide than deal with the big spaghetti mess. Um, and that's something that I've learned over the years as far as like, hey, my tide swing is only going to be between three and five feet. You know, if I can just adjust my ropes to my tide, then I can just throw a whole buoy out and rope and not have to deal with a bunch of spaghetti mess. Um, so that's kind of the target we had and, and going about the video too, I thought, man, is this going to be something where we're going to get really criticized for? And I just went with it, man, because I think that, um, a lot of people that I brought out, they kind of like the setup more. Um, and, and people aren't, you know, they can still do the, they can set ropes to, you know, 60 feet and have, you know, 10 feet of slack on a rope. I mean, on a weight hanging back. Um, but for us and for me, when I was just kind of, thinking about the video, thinking about what I do. I just thought, you know, for the, for the beginner fisherman, uh, hoop netter, um, this might be something that might make their life a little bit easier as far as dealing with ropes, trips and slips and, and stuff on the deck. Yeah. I think it, it really, um, it was, it was just about perfect for the, like you said, that guy just getting ready to, to get out there for the first time, trying to figure it out because there's nothing really like that. You know, you can go through and search forms for this information and stuff and it's out there, but now it's all just here, right in one spot, lobster hooping 101. It's, it's so nice to have it right there. And it really did just go through everything from, I mean, gear prep, boat prep, where to go, deploying the net, retrieving the net, measuring your catch and of course, reporting it. It just really goes through and gives you those basics that you need to know. Cause if you don't know them, you're, you're going to mess up somewhere down the line. Yeah. Yeah. And I think working with Steve and Joaquin and Ben and the guys at Promar, you know, Steve's a genius, man. Like I, I just love the guy for the fact that he's really good at directing, you know, and every time I come on a set or something, I'm like, Hey man, like, like I'll be the voice and, and, and you kind of be the director. And he's really good about just making things like, Hey, let's just keep it simple. Like, like, let's not get too technical because, you know, I start talking about, you know, I like to use the bite on spray, you know, and the bite on juices, you know, I'm really big with the bite on product. I haven't been for so long because I never, I would always get the question about scents and, you know, it's like, I don't want to get too technical, you know, with it, but I, I, but I like the scent, but the same thing with like bait. Like, I don't want to get too technical with bait. I don't want to get too technical with like on myself with regulations, right? Because I don't want to put the regulations on myself, right? I want people to put the regulations on themselves, Right. I want to give people the tools and the resources and I want to get people the actual product, right? Where they can go and buy the product at their local tackle shop. Um, but I want people to take it upon themselves to actually implement these things and, and make themselves a better angler. And as you know, you're a tournament fisherman. I'm a tournament fisherman. We both had to do the work, right? We No one told us like where to go. And that's the last thing people are going to do is like, hey, man, you know, the bite is biting you know, down here and this is what color they're using and, you know, it's a surface bite. Like we had to actually do the homework ourselves, what made us better anglers, right? Um, better people at the end of the day. And um, then we're able to get out better information. Yeah. So that's, what's so cool about this is this just gets you out on the water. And then once you're on the water, you start making adjustments yourself to things that you're like, Oh, you know what? This might be a little easier if I do this. And it's just to give you that basic knowledge of, Hey, Anyone can get out there and do this. If you got a boat, a kayak, if you're fishing from even up here, you know, this information is all relevant. Yep. So, yeah. and, and that, and that's the beauty of it, man. And I think, you know, I'm very critical about anything I put out, you know, and, and, and I haven't watched the video in its full length, you know, cause it's something, man, it's like, you know, I, I've been so blessed over the years to fish for some of the greatest companies in the world and do social media and people film me and stuff, man, I'm such a critic of myself. Like if I slip up a word or something, I'm just like, Oh, you know, and it's just, it's one of those things where you watch yourself. You're just like, Oh man, I know it could be better. You know, like, yeah. I know it could be like better. that's I what I look like. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I sound like. That's like, you yeah. know, and any little critical thing, but it's good to know that the guys at Promar are the same way, you know? And so they only want to put out the best stuff. You know, they only want to take the best pictures. You know, Joaquin, man, our media guy, just great photographer, you know, and just, they're, you know, Ben and the guys at Promar have really this last couple of years, man, because I've been on, I've been with Promar for quite some time. 
But I would say these last few years, man, is they're really getting down to like personal stuff with the angler, you know, and, and getting out the great shots, you know, grading out the, the good videos, the the people that know what they're talking about and capturing their audience in a way where people want to stay, you know, people want to stay and listen. People want to stay and, and, and feed into what we're selling them. And we're not just selling them a product. We're selling them information, right? We're giving them information so they can use our product. We're not just going to put our product on the shelf and say, Hey, this is our, these are our diamond jigs. These are our ahi jigs. These are our sabikis. These are our hoop nets. We're not going to say, just go buy them. We're going to actually tell you how to use them. And we're going to give you the resources to use them. Yeah. This is, this is why we made this product. It works for us. It works for all these people. Come check them out. You know, yeah. there's, there's a reason we made these products. It's not because, you know, we're just trying to sell stuff to people. We're, we're you know, there's a lot behind the scenes that a lot of people don't realize. Well, Gil, I, it was awesome talking to you. I just watched the whole video myself. I've, you know, I've been hooping for a long time, but I found it really cool. I learned stuff and, yeah. um, I know a lot of people are going to really benefit from this and it's right around the corner. Like you said. Yeah. And like I said, we got a ton of stuff coming out your way, uh, for the people that we, um, tomorrow I'm on, uh, let's talk hookup radio. Um, we have, we have a big seminar at, uh, Turner's and Lake Forest, um, and that one you have to sign up for. That's probably one of my bigger seminars throughout the year. And it, it fills up fairly quickly. So I would encourage the listeners to sign up for that if they want to do that. And then we're going to be at Bass Pro Shop uh, here in Rancho Cucamonga on that Saturday, uh, the next Saturday coming up. I believe the date on that is the 25th and 2 o'clock. And same thing. And we're we would we be doing giveaways um, for those uh, seminars. Um, and like you said, Western Outdoor News just put a great ad out um, on the Lobster 101 video. If you guys can either pick up that issue or archive it back in, in, in the Western Outdoor News app. And there's a few other articles that are going to be coming out your way. Just if it's lobster, it's most likely going to have my name on it, which I'm like I said, I'm super blessed to be a part of it, you know. And I love talking about it. Um, it seems like throughout the year, I'm talking calico bass, kayaks, spotted bay bass, tournament fishing stuff, and I get to talk about this um, for a short season. And but I make sure I enjoy every bit of it and enjoy every person that comes my way and give them the information that they need. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, we'll uh, we'll catch you next time, and um, I know we're going to be hearing from you, whether it's in the paper, or maybe back on the show in the next couple months. Awesome, man! Well, thanks for having me, man. It was a great time. This was episode 36 of the Western Outdoor News podcast. If you'd like to read the full article or watch the video Lobster Hooping 101 or learn more about trips, events, and charters held by Western Outdoor News, visit wonews.com. Thanks.